Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to today's Fox Family Innovation and Entrepreneurship Lecture. Um, first, I would like to thank Peter Fox for his generous support, um, which without, without which we would not have this lecture series. My name is Tracy Parrish. I'm Director of External Relations and Strategic Partnerships for the IGB. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Michelle Hoffman. Um, Michelle earned her PhD in Molecular and Cellular Biology from the University of California, Berkeley, and completed her postdoctoral fellowship at Brandeis University. Since August 2021, she served as Executive Director of the Chicago Biomedical Consortium, which is a consortium of biomedical researchers across Northwestern, the University of Illinois at Chicago, and the University of Chicago. Dr. Hoffman was previously the Senior Vice President of Deep Tech at P33, which is a privately funded nonprofit charged with elevating Chicagoland's innovation economy and driving inclusive, inclusive economic growth. Dr. Hoffman spent 15 years helping life sciences companies grow more, most recently as Senior Vice President at Boston-based Back Bay Life Sciences Advisors. So she has a very strong presence in industry, providing advice and, and leadership and entrepreneurship in the biotech space, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Hoffman to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Okay, so uh, hopefully this won't be death by PowerPoint. Um, and so I really encourage all of you to ask, um, or a small group here, so just shout out your questions. Really my goal today is to talk to you about how we are thinking about taking the great discoveries that are made in our various universities and using that for economic development. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about my history just because that goes into some of the programs we've built. And then I'm gonna tell you about some of the programs and really get your thoughts on that. Um, okay, so just really quickly, what, what goes into my personal history that has built these programs? So. Um, yes, I got my start at the bench, um, did a postdoc, and then decided that academic science was not for me, and did a number of positions until I ended up at a place called Lyrinc. Lyrinc is an investment bank. Uh, it is now owned by Silicon Valley Bank. Um, but at the time, uh, they basically took people like me that they called nerds, and they put them together with bankers that we called beasts. And we all worked together to really um, make sure we understood what the value of a new technology was, who would acquire it, who would fund it, how do you get to the next, what's called an inflection point in the most capital efficient way. Um, and I have to be careful because somebody asked me if they could post this recording on the web. So uh, what I'll say is, is that it was a wonderful experience. Um, there was a group that broke away to build Back Bay Life Science Advisors. I had that opportunity and I helped build that company and worked there for a pretty long time. Um, at one point, however, my husband, uh, when I decided I did not want to be a professor, my husband decided he wanted to be a professor. And so he moved us to Chicago. Um, where he is on faculty at the University of Chicago. Um, I kept my job in Boston because there really wasn't that much life sciences in Chicago, at least not to the level that I wanted to do it um, here. And I just traveled back and forth for seven years until I was recruited by P33, which is a privately funded economic development organization to think about how do we make it so nobody has to fly back and forth for seven years if they have specific skills in uh, life sciences and biotech. Um, and so I was at P33 for a while and I have to say, even though I had lived in Chicago by that time for seven years, I had never worked in Chicago. And it was a different experience. Um, again, I'm being recorded, so if you want to know uh, my uncensored views, please come find me after this talk. Um, but suffice to say, at P33, um, I was, I didn't just work on life sciences. It turns out that the problems that we have commercializing science are not just restricted to life sciences, but pretty much all of our sciences here in Chicago. And, you know, when I say Chicago or Chicago land, I do include the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in it. Um, that was something that P33 made a decision about very early on. And once you look at the statistics for the University of Illinois and Urbana-Champaign, um, it is just a huge miss to not consider it as part of the ecosystem. But that being said, um, I did work on quantum, I did work in energy, I did work on life sciences, but honestly, I 
spent many years training and working in biotech and life sciences, and it just made sense for me to continue that kind of work. And so what happened was is that there, so at P33, so first off, when I worked in deep tech, I, I was once again the nerd. Um, and second off, you know, Chicago is just a very different economic ecosystem. And while there is a huge need for doing what I did within the P33 mandate, it made sense for me to be in partnership with P33, but actually move over into the Chicago Biomedical Consortium, an organization that I'll talk about today. And the reason why is because I spent two years at P33 really studying what does it take to build a life sciences ecosystem. And the answer is always money. Um, but there are more things uh, than just money. Um, and I had a lot of those things, including some funding at the CBC. So in partnership with um, Brad Henderson, who's CEO, and Penny Pritzker, who chaired the group, um, they gave me their blessings to go pursue the executive directorship. And so what is the CBC, the Chicago Biomedical Consortium? Some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may not. It's really... Uh, money that is generously do donated by the Searle family to uh, do a number of things. We've been around since 2006. Um, we were originally started to stimulate collaboration among the scientists at the University of Illinois Chicago, Northwestern, and the University of Chicago. So we really started as a way of just funding Blue Sky Collaborative Science. Um, in 2016, they decided they wanted to go a different direction. And that instead of just collaboration, we were going to do the ultimate collaborative uh, project, and that is translation. Um, and then that hit some speed bumps. Again, you can come talk to me afterwards. Um, just because sometimes trying to mix translation and a university does not always mix. And so they had not had an executive director for two years by the time they came to me. And then finally, and this is what I have put in um, as an imperative on my tenure, is our, our third goal is to train diverse cohorts of emerging bio entrepreneurs. Um, and so uh, that, the, the two things on the right is what I'm gonna talk to you about today. What I will say is, and everybody asks, you know, why don't you increase membership? Well, we would love to. In fact, I was hired to increase membership. Our goal, though, because we have a finite pot of money and it's supposed to go to science and, and training, is to raise more dollars so that we can bring in more universities. And I believe this isn't just lip service, but in order to compete as a region, we absolutely have to do that. Okay, so what what is it that we can do? So I, I didn't... I, I, I want to say that the Chicago region, and you can see you guys are one of the four tier one research universities, we are awash in academic science, right? And usually academic science is not, like if you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have been like, yeah, come talk to me in 15 years, right? When you have developed something. However, what we know if we look on the right hand side, um, and this was certainly true as we went into the pandemic, that um, and this is one of the reasons why, what did I say? I quit my job that was easier and making more money uh, for to start working in economic development in the nonprofit sector. But one of the reasons why I did was not just because I'm a wonderful and dedicated person, but also because having worked in the ecosystem in Boston, it was just very clear that the valuations were out of whack. What does that mean? It means that people are overpaying for biotech assets in companies. And that was certainly true uh, in 2020, just as we started going into the pandemic. And so the thing about life sciences is, and specifically biopharma, is it is the only industry where Wall Street will punish you if you do not have an early stage innovation pipeline. Again, come see me afterwards and I'll give you Colin Farrell commentary on exactly how true that is. And so every uh, uh, pharma company needs to keep their pipelines going. They have now uh, settled mostly into a strategy of acquisition. And what that means is it's too expensive for them to acquire. And so they're going earlier and earlier to the stage of academic science, as you can see over here. So this is this is really, really good for anyone that's a, in a university. Um, the other thing is, is that I can say that you don't have to wait 
a long time for these things to realize economic value. So when we looked at um, uh, preclinical and phase one M&A, we saw that most of the projects had originated from universities. Uh, now, most of them are high risk, high reward, um, but almost all of them were acquired within four years of founding. So it means you can realize an economic event uh, pretty early. The problem is, is that we don't have venture capital funding here in Illinois. Um, while the rest of the U.S., and I do want to say, I'll give you some statistics. Um, while we have kept up on NIH funding and the initial academic uh, innovation that goes into developing biopharma products, uh, we certainly haven't kept up on um, VC investment. And I can give you some sobering statistics. Uh, one of them is, is we did an analysis of um, how much venture funding went into companies in California and Massachusetts just between 2016 and 2020. It was about $70 billion. All of the Midwest, I think that's 11 states, probably garnered about $7 billion during that time. So you take those 11 states compared to two and you have a 10 to 1 uh, disadvantage in terms of venture capital. The other thing I like to say is, is that if you look at um, VC funding in 2021, which was probably one of the best years on record for venture investment in biotech, Boston did $13 billion in just in biotech VC. Illinois, Chicago maybe did $400 million, right? So we're, we are really, really behind. And we know that this is not an innovation problem. We know that IP leaves the state of Illinois. IP that has been developed in our universities leaves the state of Illinois and does meaningful value creation outside of the state. Um, and so what we think, and you should always start with an organization, what problem are you solving? The problem that we are trying to solve is building more businesses around our IP here in Illinois and Chicago to retain talent. And so in order to do that, you need, so we have a lot of academic innovation. We have a lot of junior people. We don't necessarily have the experienced people that we need, and we have a lot of scientists. But capital can make all of these things possible. So drawing more capital to the types of academic innovation we have here will, we believe, help us grow the number of companies that can be built in Illinois. So I like to say um, that this is exactly like a moonshot. Um, this is our grand challenge, right? And I mean, it's a bit hyperbolic, I agree. At the same time, we mint an enormous amount of uh, PhD talent that leaves the state. Um, we have a lot of our graduates leaving the state if they want careers in biotech and life sciences. And I've talked to countless PhDs who graduate and say the only thing I could find was a career in consulting. And I think that is a waste. Um, so I do believe it's our grand challenge to train and keep some of the talent that wants to be working on biomedical applications here in Illinois. Um, and I think it's really important. So when you understand how venture works, it's very, very important to understand that there is a lot of density of innovation here that potentially has been overlooked for a few reasons, not the least of which is because the Midwest is vast. It's spread out in ways that the East Coast and even California are not. And we don't do the best job of highlighting the potential of all of our universities together for VC, right? So we have a lot of different universities saying, no, oh, I'm the only one, I'm the only one. And to make it worth their while, when you're competing against a place like UCSF, which probably gets in something like $2.8 billion in just research funding, right? It is important that we need to band together um, to really show the density of what we have if we are going to attract capital. Um, and I think, you know, this is a strategy that we know works, right? So this is what Europe has been doing. And Europe is a little bit like the Midwest, potentially with better coffee. Um, but what, what they did um, was really say, we are going to make ventures job easier for you. So they have local liaisons. So this is what the UK did. They have local liaisons that say, instead of you going up into our attic and looking at all our dusty little science across different universities, I am going to aggregate them for you and I will curate them for you. And we know that in 2019, this strategy definitely paid off in the UK. 
The problem, however, is that this becomes what I like to call the antiques roadshow problem. Most academic science is not worth very much. And that is because there are very different incentives for an academic scientist than an industry scientist. So universities don't make what industry is looking for. Things don't repeat. They're not robust. It's not just me that's saying this. Um, there are published reports, something like two-thirds of academic projects do not repeat in industry walls, whether they are uh, you know, licensed in or taken from the literature. And then if you do get something that can repeat, oftentimes it is not commercially investable. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means and why. Um, so what is it that we want to do? Right? So you have a vast amount of university research, most of which is not going to actually generate any value. Um, and again, I will talk to you forever about this. And what we seek to do is build a center where any academic can come and they will get the type of robust industry grade analysis that I did in my old life. We will be able to train uh, junior scientists on how to do this themselves so that they can go work in our entrepreneurial community. We will provide seed funding, which is definitely needed. I would say, you know, we can talk about the, the correlation between unrestricted funding and actual innovation. It's very, very tight correlation. They will network to VC, network to industry, and network to each other. And so if you remember nothing else in this talk and you fall asleep, what you need to remember is, is that we are building a, a process where we can take these great inventions that come out of our universities, we analyze them, and I'll talk about what that means, we build a plan, we validate that plan with experts, and then we go in front of our venture board, and I do need to update this slide, uh, it's actually now 19 different venture firms are on our venture board, including J&J, Abby, Abingworth, Ontogeny, some really good blue chip ones, as well as some out of uh, the ordinary ones. We uh, will fund a de-risking go, no-go experiment, and then hopefully if that works, a company will or an entity will be created and go out into the ecosystem. How does this really work? So I'll talk about some things um, that we actually designed in this process. Uh, so like I said, I started at the CBC in August of 2021. It was a pretty standard academic uh, grant-making organization, complete with um, uh, uh, NIH study section process. You can come talk to me afterwards. I'll tell you what I think of that process. Um, and again, uh, what we would do is, is we would make the professors pitch and they would develop these pitches and uh, all types of things. And we were like, no, we're not doing that anymore. So how have we designed this? And it took, like I said, about 12 months to do this. So first and foremost, we said no more deadlines. Um, you submit your idea whenever you have your idea. And the second thing we said is, we do not believe it is in anyone's best interest to make the professor pitch, right? So you train for many years, you have a different job, and suddenly you're on Shark Tank. It does not make any sense. So all we want is the letter of intent, and then with that letter of intent, we do a triage. If that triage hits a certain spot, then we'll take it out to do full review with our entrepreneurial fellow team. And when I say we take it out for full review, what we're actually doing is building the grant application for you. We call this an investment thesis, and the reason why we call it an investment thesis and not a grant application is because we want to know if we put our $250,000 into this project, what is the potential and chance for return? And again, this is something that I learned during my career before I started uh, doing this. Um, we work very collaboratively, sorry, that was gross, uh, with the scientist, right? So we, there are no surprises. Uh, we bring them along every step of the way. If we think it's kind of a dog, we're going to tell them it's a dog. But the, the difference is that instead of it being opaque and saying, you know, look, we, we won't support you. What we are is very transparent and give them all of the research that says, here are the gaps. And I can talk about, I just had a venture board meeting this morning, and I can talk about how that pans out. Um, and then when we go in front of the venture board, we take the scientists with us. They 
present the technical aspects and, and answer questions, but we present everything else. And that is because we know how venture thinks and what they're going to be interested in. If we get some reliable feedback from the venture board, and I'll show you what that looks like, we will fund it. It is not consensus driven because that's just not how this works. Um, what we're looking for is, is uh, uh, discharging what we call financing risk. Um, if it gets accepted, then uh, one of the fellows actually project manages it. So let me just, I'm gonna run you through a few examples and just stop me at any time, really don't have to wait until Q&A, just raise your hands or throw something at me, whatever. Um, but this is a project that came out of a lab at Northwestern. Um, it was Shana Kelly's lab. She is an engineer. She likes to engineer things. And she had a CRISPR screening platform that found a modulator of KRAS gain of function. We thought that was really interesting because KRAS gain of function drives 25% of tumors. Um, but obviously, there's still a lot of questions, right? So what I can tell you VC do not want is, you know, cancer is a large burden, and I have something for cancer. Um, so we needed to really understand why was this, why as a small academic consortium could we compete in places that have extreme amounts of competition? So first and foremost, um, what we checked was the biological relevance. And so this is from TCGA. And what you can see is there's a tiny cohort of humans that actually have a mutation in this modulator. And when they get KRAS gain of function tumors, there's 100% survival. So we know that this modulator is so far clinically silent. Um, and now we have biological validation. So that gave us confidence to proceed. Um, and then my fellows took this, again, in collaboration with the rest, uh, with the scientific team, and they did all of the full-scale diligence. So what this includes is, um, if you've been following the field, both Amgen and Marathi have uh, new therapies for KRAS, gain of function, which has heretofore been considered an undruggable drug. Um, and those drugs are not very good. They're covalent modifiers, uh, they're very dirty, they have a lot of side effects. And even so, those drugs in a single tumor type, which I think is non-small cell lung for both of them, are predicted to do about $2 billion. So we, we went and we said, you know, here's where the market is, here's what the residual unmet need is because there's multiple uh, uh, tumor types and there are the the current um, drugs only hit G12 to C mutations um, and so we're looking across different uh, mutations and different tumor types. Um, we talked about the biological validity. Uh, we believe the MOA and the, it, the mechanism of action is actually very differentiated and we think that it's actually going to enable us to not have escape mutants in the same way that you're seeing in other approaches. And then this is the type of thing that you need when you are sitting in front of VC. I did it this morning. I do it all the time. They will always say, almost always say, unless they have really studied this approach, the approach that you're bringing forward, in which case they're probably not going to invest because they've already made an investment. You need to say, why you are competitively advantaged. And competitively advantaged means not just knowing what's out there on the market, but knowing the entire pipeline of what's being funded. So what we can do is go through the 80 different projects that are being funded by industry and VC. And what we did is we went in and said, from a pan KROS perspective, people are looking at old targets, mostly like uh, uh, SOS1 and SHIP2. Or they're, you know, it's pharma that's using their chemistry to go after every type of mutation. So this type of pan KRAS strategy, we thought, was very unique. And then finally, the last thing we do is actually develop the set of experiments with the PI that we think are important to do. And again, this is really important. I can tell you now, having done this, uh, been running through this process for whatever, six or seven months, there, I cannot count how many professors come in and say, I'm gonna do this experiment. What is this experiment? It's called in vivo characterization. What does that mean? They don't know, right? So if you, we are going to find an experiment, that every bit of that experiment needs to go into what is called de-risking 
the science. Um, when you do basic science, you want to discover more things. When you are at our stage, you want to actually check that everything you think is true is true. It is kicking the tires and it is a type of experiment that has to be validated with industry and venture. And so that is what we were able to do down to which cell lines to use and what the right benchmarks were. When we took this in front of our venture board, you can see on the right in blue, we asked them to rate this in terms of commercial, clinical, and financing risk, of which we got some scores. But I think more importantly is the fact that we asked another specific question, which is, if we fund this experiment and it hits this specific benchmark, which we pre-specified, would you be interested in engaging with this scientific group? And the green indicates yes. So that means two years before they need equity financing, they would be interacting with a group of VC and other industry professionals that are now familiar with our work and have actually made input into it. So this was a slam dunk case. Um, I think we knew this was going to be a slam dunk even before we went through the diligence. So now I'm going to tell you about something that's a little bit different. Actually, I just realized I need a mouse. Is there, is there a mouse here so that I can click on some slides? Okay, so while that's happening, um, what I'm going to tell you about, this is from... Sorry. Sorry. Okay, um, I should have mentioned that. <clears throat> there you go. It's a microbiome platform from a professor at the University of Chicago. And we very much like this professor um, because he's extremely creative. Because uh, only a creative person would go and try and get funding for something in the microbiome. So. This was a much more challenging um, uh, project, and we came out the gate. Any minute, huh? we came out the gate uh, with the reason why, and the reason why is because, and this is where I, again I need to edit myself. So venture is a very um, there uh, that venture capitalists tend to think alike. That's not always true, but it is sometimes true. And so you can see this here. In 2013, fecal matter transplant uh, actually proved itself from a clinical perspective. And then you start to see a whole bunch of money come in. Everybody is talking about the microbiome. We are at microbiome hype probably around 2018, 2019. And then in 2021, flagship pioneering's huge bet on the microbiome um, as I like to say, literally shits the bed. And therefore, nobody wants to invest in the microbiome ever again. And there are many reasons why this should and could be true, but we knew going into it that it was going to be a tough sell. And lo and behold, we were right. So the first thing we did is really come up and say, what and this is just only part of it, but what has actually held the microbiome back from becoming a real clinical application? Part of it is, is the fact that most microbiome therapies take what's called a bottom-up approach. And that means that you, you, you know, we know that fecal matter transplant works, but we don't know how to recreate it. And that requires a humongous knowledge of biology. In a top-down approach, what you need is the knowledge of emergent function. You don't have to know how the biology works. You do have to know how to, like what you are selecting for if you want a microbial consortium. And this is how our professor was thinking and the other thing that we thought was cool about his approach is, is that if you do take a top-down approach, while you only need an emergent function, now you need a lot more complexity if you're going to sample all the genetic space that's there with a microbial consortium. And our guy had a way of dealing with that complexity that we thought was statistically rigorous. Um, so. We were able to convince them of this, and I think this slide was extremely helpful. 
where we started to show, look, we know you guys are all disillusioned with what's in the pipeline, but if we look at what's in the pipeline and what's clogging it up, you have a lot of different companies that are of this bottom-up approach. And we know that certain events are going to happen to move those through, whereas you can see that the top-down approach is getting more financing. I, I know this is a simple concept to scientists, right? The idea that you could show people data and they'd be like, oh, I didn't think about that. But you're talking about people that don't have any time and they only know what they know and they'll make snap decisions based on what they know unless you tell them otherwise. So the ability to put data in a framework to challenge those assumptions is really important. But in order to do that, you need to understand both the business aspects as well as the science. And that, I think, is the unique innovation that we've been able to do. So we were able to convince them that this platform was indeed differentiated. But the pro other problem with the platform technology is, is a lot of times it's a hammer in search of a nail. And while this guy had proven the, the platform in terms of, uh, I, I, he'd done a pilot in Klebsiella pneumonia, nobody is going to pay for Klebsiella pneumonia. And honestly, antimicrobials are just not a good commercial opportunity at this time. So the other thing that we were able to do is we were able to take, and this is my group um, with our fellows, is say, look, we know what this thing is good at. We know how to develop indications. Which one should we do? And we came up with 180 indications uh, that could be applied to this platform. We did a number of filtering events, but we couldn't do it exhaustively. So in my old life, I would do this exhaustively. 6,000 genetic diseases, sure, no problem. We'll go through all of them. We don't have the time and the resources to do that in an academic consortium. And so what we did was say that ultimately we're looking for archetype indications. And the way that we split it out was we said, look, a microbial consortium can do three different things. It can displace bacteria, which is essentially antimicrobial. Um, but microbial consortium can also chew up things or spit out things, so that compensatory mechanism. And then finally, it can do systemic modulation. So this is where things that people have pursued, like the gut-brain access and cancer, reside. But it's also where the biggest disillusionment is because it is, there is so much complexity that it's really difficult to build an emergent function that you can assay for that. So what we said is, let's limit ourselves to these, these two of these archetypes, and let's build a business case for both. Um, and so what did we come up with? And we came up with gout and acne. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but suffice to say, we get down to if we did acne, what is the experimental model? What is the benchmark? Um, with gout, the same thing. And the thing we liked about gout was is that there had been a notable clinical failure that we thought failed for reasons weren't necessarily to do with the drug or the target. And that company had animal results and a model that we could use as well. So we have an automatic benchmark. Um, and then the other thing is, is that you have to convince them that there is commercial opportunity. Now, I'll tell you in acne, there is not commercial opportunity. And so it was just laughed out of the room for good reason. Um, uh, we did try to make an argument that acne is the gateway to other uh, dermatological diseases. Um, but for other reasons, that just didn't catch on. With gout, however, we were very confident about this. Um, gout is a huge problem, and right now you either have generic drugs that will screw up your liver and 50% of people don't, don't tolerate them or come off of them, or you have Cristexa, which is adding uricase into your bloodstream to, uh, gout is the buildup of uric acid, um, and it's $375,000 a year. So we certainly felt, and we did a commercial model, and we tested this with, with, with what is called a target product profile, and we had a pretty convincing argument that we could get to $1.2 $1. $1. billion just as an add-on in 5% of the patient population. So we were pretty sure about that. Um, <laughs> the venture board was not. So, uh, and, and again, happy to talk for a long time about venture and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, group dynamics. But essentially what they said is, we like the platform. You've convinced us that the platform is good. I, am, I don't want to use anybody's money, even yours, to pay for something that we think is an 18th century disease. Um, 
I can tell you I was I was pretty mad. I was disappointed and I knew that we were right. But that being said, they're a venture board. Um, and so what we were able to do, uh, so I was really angry about this. I went back to the, the principal investigator and he was actually pleased. He said, actually, this is really good. I have validation that they like the platform. What they don't like is the indication. And that is because we're limited by our emergent functions. And he went back and retooled his assay so that we could do other emergent functions. And now we have spent money to look at a TH17 to TREG um, uh, balance. And this I have now come to see as a win because ultimately what you're trying to do at this stage is what's called product market fit. Right. Um, and so because they didn't like our clinical indication, if we had continued to fund that, I think more VC, regardless of whether I think that they're right or wrong, more VC would have said, no, we're not doing this. And we certainly don't have the funds to fight that uh, um, to fight that sentiment. And it is really, really important to start getting these early looks often because too often scientists will go down one route that is not going to be accepted by the, the financing com community and they will have blown all of their experimental money doing that. Um, so I want to say there the, the key to how we are able to do this and able to do it at the scale that we are is the fact that we have these entrepreneurial fellows who do the work. Um, I, there are a lot of fellowship programs. There are a lot in Chicago. Uh, there's a lot outside. There's a both Botnik fellow and there's, there's a couple of others that try to do exactly the same thing. What I'll tell you is different about ours is that you have me who has quite a bit of experience working with venture and industry. I also have somebody who's training the fellows day to day, and this is Elizabeth McMath, who also has a PhD uh, in genetics from Wisconsin, and she worked at Novartis doing global search and evaluation for cell and gene therapies, right? So it, life sciences and biotech, it's too specialized. It's a regulated industry. It requires knowledge of many, many different things. It's too complex to let people just sort of figure it out on their own, and this is something that I believe really strongly. Um, and so the other thing that I think is key to our success is that um, what we ask is we ask, uh, these are fellows that are paid full time. Uh, they're paid a salary of $85,000 a year plus benefits. They come to us and they learn about how to de-risk early science. In return, we ask them, and obviously there's no binding agreement, but we ask them to pledge to go work in the Chicago ecosystem after their time. And so what this means is, is that we are seeding the ecosystem with young scientists in an inclusive manner who are being trained at the cutting edge of how is it that venture and the finance community is thinking about what to actually fund versus not fund. Um, and so for any of you who are interested in this fellowship program, we take PhDs. Um, we're opening up applications again in April. I, I won't go through this in detail, but there's a lot of benefits to this fellowship. And then really what we're doing is teaching them early science commercialization. We're teaching them about healthcare and how it's de delivered. Um, we are asking them to go through and they do all of this down to what is the right assay, what is the right benchmark, what are the right comparables, who are the right VC to contact, and then we network them to the rest of the Chicago community, including our venture board. Um, and so our hope is, is that what we're doing is, you know, it'd be great if we funded some projects that are good. Um, but we know even with the best of uh, the most resources and the best people, that is difficult. What we are doing is hopefully seeding the ecosystem with young scientists who otherwise would have to move away and actually um, really get a flywheel working uh, uh, in a virtuous cycle. And so our hope is in between the fellows analysis, using this venture board, um, and as well as the ways that we do diligence, we will hopefully pick potential winners. Um, I want to say this isn't easy. So we are building a pipeline. And I have talked to different people who say it will take at least three years to build a pipeline. So at this point, we have a limited number of things that are actually eligible for the $250,000. Even when they go through our review and we start checking under the hood, we almost always find a reason to stop. And what we have been doing is 
for the areas that we think are really exciting, we will put in a little bit of money for an enabling experiment. So when I started, I thought we would be able to be here, that we would be able to write $250,000 checks and we would be very close, two hundred fifty dollars to $500,000 away from an equity investment. This is actually honestly where we are. Um, and I can talk about that forever as well. But what we've decided to do, because we are agile, is really think about how we can better de-risk some of the scientific projects that have the most potential. These are so early that we're at the point of target validation and assay development. Um, and so how do we think about, because these are different, these are very, very different modes of saying, uh, uh, modes of investment, uh, uncertainty, et cetera. And these are what are called the director's funds. And so here, what we're looking for are projects with transformative potential, as well as biological validation. So in almost all cases, if we are going to do this, we are going to need to see some validation in human genetics or with uh, human tissue that this is, in fact, relevant. Um, that is different than how we think about the accelerator awards, where we're looking at things that are more developed and, and have more evidence in the totality. Um, and so for the last thing, I was going to talk about our affinity group, but I'm just going to end here and take your questions. Uh, the, the other thing that we are struggling with or actually, let's not say we're struggling with, that we have an opportunity to improve. Um, and which is one of the reasons that I would love to be able to work with the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign is that from a chemistry perspective, our scientists are really good at target validation, at finding a biological pathway that they have inspected and really understand. The problem is, is that we don't have a lot of good chemical matter. And when it comes down to it, we go to public libraries, and then we rely on MedChem to change them, and that's just too expensive and too laborious. And so the other thing that we're thinking about, and, and, and so I'm just going to offer commentary, which is the fact is, is that there is almost always a mismatch when universities try to do commercialization. And the reason why is because academic science is a cottage industry, right? Every lab does their own thing in their own way, with their own budget, et cetera. But at a certain point, past target validation, sometimes even before, you are looking at industrial scale capabilities. And so oftentimes we are trying to build high throughput assays with you know, fourth year graduate students and non-optimal materials. Um, and what you really want is to send that to a CRO. Um, you really want somebody who has done this over and over and over again who actually doesn't think about, you know, what are new things that I can discover? It's really about engineering at that point. And so what we're trying to do at the CBC is think about how we can better collectivize this and industrialize this. And one of the things that we're trying to do is get more proprietary libraries that the CBC could fund that would be open to our community. So um, let me just skip over here. Um, so. Again, if you've fallen asleep and you have now woken up, I would like you to know that we are building a diverse cohort of entrepreneurial fellows that will be seeding the biotech ecosystem in Chicago. Um, we encourage applications. Our, our uh, process opens in April um, for a fall of 2023 start. We fund science, translational science, with broad biomedical uh, applications and right now though we don't have the funding to take uh, Urbana Champaign projects we can take them if you find a UAC Northwestern and U Chicago collaborator um, and so we would be able to take those joint projects and then the thing that I didn't talk about is how we actually build more community um, with science to make sure that there's more community, not just within academia, but the key to translation is to have more com community outside of academia. And I'll talk to you about why I think that works so well in Massachusetts and California. Um, and so I want to gratefully acknowledge the several funds of the Chicago Community Trust who funds everything that we do. And with that, I will take your questions or give you time back.